Major funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Some 30 minutes ago, the planes bearing our prisoners left Iranian airspace and are now free of Iran. Tonight on Frontline, Iran. Five years ago, it was a national nightmare. Ours is not a country that responds or ever will respond to intimidation or blackmail. Tonight, the hostages tell their own story. In the back of my head, I heard the, the rifles being loaded, the, the bolt being shot, and then the, the click of the trigger on, on, an empty, on an empty chamber. Tonight, hostage in Iran. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. Tonight on Frontline, a special season premiere. It was exactly five years ago that this country joyfully, tumultuously welcomed home 52 Americans who had been held hostage in Iran for 444 days. They came home to yellow ribbons and parades, and most of us were so glad to see them that we didn't spend much time talking about what their life in captivity had really been like. Tonight, it is that story we bring you. It's in their own words and includes never-before-seen film taken inside the American Embassy compound by some of the Iranian militants themselves. It's a first-hand account of what the hostages went through for 14 and a half months, how they coped with isolation, duress, and fear, not knowing what was going on in the world outside, whether in Iran itself or in the far-off United States. Against a background of high-risk politics and power struggles, this is the personal story of America's traumatic encounter with Iran's revolution. It's called Hostage in Iran and is produced for Frontline by Les Harris. Our story starts at the White House on October 22, 1979, day minus 14. U.S. President Jimmy Carter, believing the exiled Shah of Iran needed medical tests and treatment, allowed him to enter the United States. It was the right thing to do. And it was at the end of almost a full year of uh, good relations with Iran. Eight months earlier, the Ayatollah Khomeini had returned home from his exile in France. Although a provisional government existed, he immediately became the supreme power in the country. His triumphant return was treated like the second coming of Mohammed. The Ayatollah's campaign to transform Iran into an Islamic Republic began in zeal. The first target was the Shah. He was tried in absentia. The sentence was death. He was killing our people. 7,000 people was died in this country. This deep hatred for the Shah was well known to the American government. The fact that the U.S. had supported the Shah prior to the revolution made the embassy in Tehran a high-risk posting. The U.S. man on the spot was chargé d'affaires Bruce Langan. Langan felt strongly that the U.S. should not admit the Shah, and he explained why in a top-secret letter to the State Department. I thought that until the revolution had put its own institutions of government in place, and until we had put an ambassador in place and thus signaled in that way our acceptance of the revolution, that it would be dangerous to uh, proceed with his admission. Jimmy Carter's decision to admit the Shah incensed the Iranian public. There were daily demonstrations outside the main gates of the U.S. Embassy compound. Inside, security had already been beefed up, and the staff had been cut back to 70. 
Lee Schatz was the embassy's agricultural attaché. On the morning of November 4th, 1979, Schatz was leaving the embassy grounds for his office, which was off the compound. Went to leave via the front gate of the embassy, which was the shortest distance back to my office. Uh, as I walked out of the chancery that morning, there was a lot of chanting going on out front. We knew that it was the celebration. Uh, one year previously, students had been shot by the Shah's people in the streets. But at, on that particular morning, uh, we did not uh, perceive that we were under any more threat than usual. However, Langen was concerned about security for his 27-acre compound. So that morning, he went to the Iranian foreign ministry to ask for more protection. With him was Vic Tomseth. The, the reaction generally when we asked for uh, increased protection was one of sympathy. While Iranian diplomats at the foreign ministry sympathized with the Americans, a mile away at the embassy, several hundred students were swarming around the main gates. Just before 11 a.m., the attack began. They were over the walls, and soon the chain on the main gate was cut. This was filmed by a student with his 8mm camera, here showing the motor pool area being overrun. The motor pool was behind the main gates to the embassy compound. To their right was the chancery, the operational hub of the embassy that housed the sensitive communication systems. Way behind the chancery, past some fields and some bungalows, was the two-story consular building where visas were issued. It was completely sealed off from the rest of the compound. The students apparently knew that the 13 Marines on the compound had standing orders not to shoot. But to make sure, the women led the assault. As the attackers overran the motor pool area, Marine Sergeant Jimmy Lopez, who was stationed in the consular building at the rear of the compound, heard the news on his walkie-talkie. It happened so fast that as soon as I heard the transmission about people being over the walls, I got up and I looked through my little peephole behind me and there were already people running on the compound. The heavy front doors of the chancery had been bolted shut. Inside were 45 Americans plus Iranian staff and some visitors. The Marine guards inside fired tear gas to buy time. The standard procedure usually is just to lock down and wait for the uh, local government to come and rescue you, wait for the cavalry to come over the hill. When it was realized help wasn't coming, one of the Chancery security officers, Al Golazinski, went outside to try to persuade the students to leave. He was immediately captured. The uh, Iranians had radios. They would captured radios, so the uh, net was full of garbage. They were jamming transmissions. The landlines, the telephones, were impossible to get through because by that time, the uh, basement had been taken. The students broke in through a basement window. Lee Schatz saw all of this from the safety of his office two blocks away. He was in radio contact with the besieged diplomats on the second floor of the chancery. Letting them know as far as what was occurring on the roof of the embassy. Uh, people uh, very early on managed to get on the roof, were cutting cables, uh, taking down antennas, pulling down the American flag. The students now threatened to shoot the captured American. This security camera relayed the chilling scene to his colleagues inside the chancery. What the people in the chancery had been told was that the students just wanted them to, to come out and they'd hold them for an hour or two. They were trying to make a statement about their uh, position, about the Shah being allowed uh, into the U.S. and continuing to stay in the U.S. With no help coming, the besieged staff retreated floor by floor. One American, John Limbert, who spoke Farsi, went out to try to save Al Golazinski's life. He too was immediately blindfolded and bound and threatened with death. The Americans surrendered. While this was happening, 10 Americans had locked themselves in the security vault. They were frantically shredding confidential documents on the orders of Bruce Langen who was still at the Iranian Foreign Ministry and had given the orders to start shredding via radio. Uh, there were people outside the vault door itself. Um, we 
instructed the people, however, to stall that off as long as they could in order to complete the destruction program in the vault. But when they uh, reported that they had done that, then we uh, told them to go ahead and surrender. But there were still many secret documents locked away in Bruce Langan's office safe, and Langan had the key. Later, this would come to haunt the Americans. None of these details were known to the other Americans hiding on the other side of the compound in the consular building, which was walled off from the rest of the grounds. All they knew was that the chancery had been overrun. Head of the consular section, Dick Moorfield. About 3.30, it was clear that help was not going to be coming from the Iranians. We also heard some people on the roof and began to smell smoke. I presume they were trying to burn their way through at the ceiling. Someone then threw a brick through the washroom window. Consul Bob Anders heard the crash. They put a ladder up to the window and a, and a couple of these uh, uh, demonstrators started to climb up to try to come in. We had a Marine security guard on duty in our building and he uh, went in to uh, repel this attack. I kicked open the door and came in so quickly, just screaming my fool head off, that I shocked the Iranian coming through the window. And he was in a bit of a panic, didn't know what to do, because he saw me walking towards him with the business end of this gas grenade facing him, and Gary Lee standing behind me with a shotgun. And he proceeded to scramble out the window as fast as possible. Meanwhile, in the chancery, the captured Americans, blindfolded and bound, were being taken to the ambassador's residence. The students then started playing Russian roulette with the women hostages to try to learn the combinations to Bruce Langan's safe. By now, in the consular building, 12 Americans and some Iranians were preparing to leave through the side entrance on the street. Mark and Cora Lijek were among them. Fortunately for us, the uh, terrorists had not blocked the street entrance. Uh, the consulate building, unlike the chancery, has a direct uh, door onto the back street. I asked Rich Queen to um, open the door and uh, start the scattering process. So I opened it up and there were three or four dressed as police, national police, but I think they were revolutionary guards actually. And I said, hello, how are you in Farsi? And he said, oh fine, how's everything? I said, well, we're leaving the building. He said, okay. And at that time, people started to file out. The Americans split into two parties. Six went in one group, led by Consular Chief Dick Moorfield. Well, we'd gotten about another half a block, a block or so. A group of eight or nine young militants ran up and surrounded us and, and said that uh, we were hostage. And, I, and I, at first I didn't catch that. I said, uh, well, wait a minute, we, we've, you've got the building, Take, do whatever you want, uh, burn it down, uh, do whatever you think. But, uh, and they said, no, you don't understand, you're a hostage. Dick Moorfield said, just keep on walking, don't stop, don't talk, just keep on walking straight. As we started to move off again, the, the young man with a gun fired a shot. You know. uh, and they surrounded us saying, CIA, shouting CIA, CIA, etc some other nonsense. The guard started frisking me for weapons and he found the radio and he pulled it off and he started to walk off with it. He was going to take the radio and I just said, excuse me a second and he turned around and I smiled very nicely at him, started using some hand gestures on him to confuse him. And then I got the radio from him and I pointed at it and I was telling him things about it. And then I grabbed the bottom, grabbed it by the antenna, and just turned and smashed it on the wall and destroyed about $4,000 worth of electrical equipment in one swing. And I handed the shattered components back to him and smiled and told him, now you can have it. The second escaping group, these five Americans, led by Bob Anders, had taken a different route and were on their way to the British Embassy, a standard contingency plan. Their route became blocked by demonstrators. At that point, Bob said, I'm going home. And we said, we're going with you. <laughs> um, we just wanted to get off the street um, because we, I think I noticed at least it seemed like some people were starting to stare at us. The relative safety of Bob Anders' apartment was only four blocks away. But opposite it was a revolutionary Comité headquarters. 
so when we came to the street where the committee headquarters was, we crossed it one at a time. We'd peer around the corner, see if anyone was looking, then make a mad dash for the other building on the other side. And uh, we did that, you know, one after the other. Finally, we made it into Bob's apartment, uh, which was quite a relief, I think, for all of us. As soon as we got in there, we uh, immediately got on the telephone, and we were trying to call uh, friends uh, around town to see if they knew what was happening. And we were trying to call different apartments and couldn't get answers anywhere. I became convinced that uh, we were the only ones who'd been able to get out. Lijak was right, because back at the main gates of the embassy, Dick Moorfield's captured group were being forced back to the motor pool area. By now, it was late afternoon in Tehran, and the hostages were being split into small groups. Moorfield and his colleagues were about to join them. I was telling to the people with me, keep your head up, look forward, don't be antagonized by, don't let them sh uh, harass us by taking the photos, that we've got to maintain our dignity as we're going in. They escorted us to the Chargé's residence, the ambassador's house. <clears throat> and um, when we were there, they separated us. My hands were bound uh, with a sort of nylon cord or wire, nylon, which got cut off the circulation. It did cut off the circulation after a while. And our hands were, were tied to the chairs, and our feet were tied to the feet of the chairs. And at which time they went through the show of questioning us before the cameras that this young man had. There was one American who shall remain nameless who was going around telling the Iranians who each American was, giving them information. Uh, he should have been shot for that, but I don't set policy. Back in Washington, D.C., the State Department had set up a fully functioning Iran working desk within hours of the takeover. Although concerned, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance and his officials were sure that the Iranian government would eventually come to the rescue, just as it had the previous February when the embassy had been overrun for a few hours. Like then, rescue would be just a matter of time. It was now getting dark in Tehran and had started to rain. Still, the embassy's takeover made for an evening's entertainment. Whole families came down to the gates. They chanted, death to America, death to the Shah. Meanwhile, Bruce Langen, still at the foreign ministry, arranged for the safety of Lee Schatz and told him to take sanctuary in the Swedish embassy. I left my door, I uh, just walked up the stairs uh, to the Swedish embassy's office suite, and uh, they were expecting me. At the foreign ministry, the minister, Ibrahim Yazdi, finally met with Langen and Tomseth. He told the diplomats he would speak to the Revolutionary Council that night and assured them the crisis would soon be resolved. Mr. Yazdi asked me where I proposed to spend the night. And I said, uh, well, that's your responsibility, Mr. Foreign Minister. Uh, I'm here uh, with the assurance that your government is going to provide protection to me for me and my mission. It is your responsibility. Can you assure me that I will be safe on the streets? And obviously you cannot. We then began to uh, press him for assurances about um, our own security because uh, uh, the Iranian government did have an obligation to provide that. Um, Yazdi wa just wanted us to go away. His, his attitude was, uh, I've got enough headaches. You know, you people are, are just making my life more complicated than it need be. So Vic Thompson, Bruce Langen, and security officer Mike Howland were then taken to an ornate ballroom used for diplomatic receptions. They demanded phones. Uh, they were taken in and plugged into the ballroom so that we were able to continue our discussion with Washington on one of the lines and use the other phone to make local calls. It was a very uncomfortable night, a very worrisome night. Uh, we obviously could not uh, accept uh, with assurance what he had told us, and clearly we hoped that what he had told us was would be true by morning. But we had no assurance of that, and we were very skeptical. Meanwhile, at the Swedish embassy, the end of day one of the hostage crisis left Lee Schatz with nowhere to go. So he stayed the night there in the embassy. 
he was at least more comfortable than his 63 captured colleagues. But uh, we were just, we were sure that this would be over in a day at most. Day one of the 444 day hostage crisis was finally over. As day two dawned, Lee Schatz continued to monitor the compound from his vantage point in the Swedish embassy. A mullah showed up inside the grounds. The mullah was no less than the son of the Ayatollah Khomeini. If he had told them to release the hostages, there's little doubt they would have, but he didn't. Instead, he gave them the Ayatollah's support. Things were very controlled. From very early on after the takeover, uh, it was obvious that people were in charge. Most of the militants were students, mainly from Tehran University. They were zealous and conservative Shiite Muslims, the dominant faith of Iran. They were angry at the provisional government for maintaining normal relations with the United States. So in October 1979, a group of 30 or 40 of them met to plan an action as much against their government as it was against the United States. In fact, their siege of the U.S. Embassy was only supposed to last three to five days. When the government proved incapable of stopping the students, and the Ayatollah signaled his support publicly, the students found they had started something worth continuing. With massive popular support, including elements of the military, they then demanded the return of the Shah as a way to end the takeover. The hostages are here because this is the only thing that we can have here against America. And we tell them that we will do have the hostages until they send the Shah here. The Iranians were looking for some people by name. And the word that came back to... Uh, Swedish embassy was that my name happened to be one of them. The person who then gave sanctuary to Lee Schatz was a friend of his who worked in the Swedish embassy. And was taken to a private residence and uh, spent the next two weeks in that residence day and night. That same day in North Tehran, a cultural center called the Iran America Society, or Anjaman, was being overrun. The Angemans director was Kate Cobe. Her deputy was Bill Royer. They escaped the students and were given sanctuary by the Germans in their cultural center, the Goethe Institute. The Germans were absolutely fantastic. Um, they provided us not only the, the space to get to immediately, but uh, were quite willing and offered, as a matter of fact, um, to take us into their homes if we needed um, a sort of deep cover. But Cobe and Royer then made a big mistake. They returned to the Anjaman after hearing that the militants had left. There, they were joined by Lillian Johnson, who had been at the Tehran airport during the takeover. Within 15 minutes of her return, they were all captured. And that all three of them were, were being taken to, uh, uh, to the embassy compound and join the other people being held hostage there. At that point, we realized we had to do something about uh, the other five, who at that point had gone back to their apartments. Uh, and uh, so I set about to see if I couldn't make some arrangements to get them to a more safer location. The five consular staff in the apartment, plus Lee Schatz, were the only Americans now out. Bruce Langan and Vic Thompson still trusted the Iranian foreign ministry enough to tell them that the six were free. When we first learned that the six were free in the city, we had informed the uh, foreign ministry at the level we thought appropriate and sought their assistance. I said, uh, in effect, uh, that you should be aware that there are several people uh, who were not uh, caught by the student militants who are presently in Tehran. In fact, the Iranian diplomats chose not to tell their government about the six Americans, and the secret remained in the foreign ministry and away from the student militants until Vic Thompson could arrange for the five consular escapees to be picked up by British embassy staff. Uh, the British had a housing compound in the northern part of the city, 
and uh, they, they put them up there. While they were safe behind the gates of the British compound, for Kate Cobe, it was the start of 14 months of captivity. When we arrived at the embassy compound, we were separated and searched. The young woman who had um, done, uh, who did my search was a real novice at the task and she sort of patted a little bit here and, and there and, and was terribly embarrassed when she had to ask me to take off my dress. And um, so she did her job and she left. Well, evidently she described what she'd done because she came back a few minutes later and said, they said I didn't do a good job, I had to do it over. And um, one of my colleagues, I think, is, has said at some point that it was rather like teaching hostage 101 sometimes. The blindfolds were removed, we were tied to chairs, our hand, wrists were bound to chairs, and then they said no talking. Most of the hostages would not be allowed to talk to each other again for four and a half months. They were separated and placed in the ambassador's residence and elsewhere on the compound. The seven captured women were segregated from the men. The students were convinced that most of the Americans were spies and tore the place apart in search of evidence. One suspect was Kate Cobe, and they kept her apart from the others. In the Islam is not different between women and men when they are spies. Spies is a spy. Yeah. They accused me of, of spying and all different kinds of things. Um, they said, give us your jewelry. One of our experts will examine it. My first reaction was, well, if you think you're going to get much ransom out of this, you better think again. So I pulled off my rings and, and bracelets and some necklaces, and I was handing it to them. And I realized that they weren't looking at it for value. They were looking at it as though it were going to hold some sort of a wondrous, mysterious something or the other. I'm not sure what. But as the days passed, the Iranian students found positive proof of spying activities. We know that they are a spy because we have the documents. One of the incriminating documents outlined a cover identity for a CIA official. Fake passports were also found along with lists of Iranian contacts, false license plates for agents' vehicles, and many payoff envelopes stashed with hundreds of U.S. dollar bills. These discoveries gave the Iranian students the leverage they needed. Now the hostages would become a factor in the bitter internal struggle to control the revolution. Prime Minister Bazargan was powerless. The Bazargan government, the provisional revolutionary government, also resigned that day. And at that point, I think we, uh, uh, we began to think that this was not going to be resolved immediately. When the provisional government fell, and power devolved to the Revolutionary Council and the students and the streets. And then my capacity to function was severely limited. It was very clear very quickly that those who held power were very reluctant to speak to us, to uh, sully their reputations politically, if you will. One of the casualties of the government's collapse was Ibrahim Yazdi, he was replaced as foreign minister by Abul Hassan Bani Sadr, who initially sided with the students and their demands. But President Carter would formally reject Bani Sadr's request to return the Shah. The United States of America will not yield to international terrorism or to blackmail. So the hostages remained at the mercy of the militants, and the crisis became Carter's personal nightmare. That night, uh, the second night, uh, I was allowed to lie down, bound hand and foot. Um, and in the middle of the night, uh, someone came up and tapped me on the shoulder, woke me up and whispered, are you Mr. Moorfield? I said I was, and they said, come with me. They um, untied my feet, left my hands tied, put a blanket over my head and um, took me away from the embassy compound. To a number of automobile changes, my moving from one car to another. And eventually I ended up, I think, in the student dorm someplace. Moorfield and five others had been spirited out of the embassy to act as hostage for the hostages in case the Iranian government attempted a rescue. He was then terrorized. In the back of my head I heard the, the rifles being loaded. The, the bolt being shot, and then the, the click of the 
trigger on on an empty on an empty chamber. Uh, I think it was very clearly intended to to intimidate us uh, at that time. It was also an indi- for me it was an indication that um, I might not get out and uh, I was likely to be there for a long time. As chaos reigned, fear spread throughout the foreign community. U.S. businessmen fled Iran en masse, taking flights to anywhere. For the British, who were hiding the fugitive Americans, anxiety grew that their residential compound might be attacked that day. So the British ambassador phoned Vic Thompson. He suggested that uh, it might not be safe to keep the five people that they had uh, in their housing compound much longer. One of the British officers came and informed us uh, that we were going to have to leave. We were uh, somewhat surprised and uh, perhaps even a little uh, shocked at this because we felt this was a, a good place to, to wait out the whole thing. The five had nowhere to go, so they turned to Vic Thompson for help. He, in turn, called this man, Somchai Sarawanet. Somchai was a Thai cook who worked for Kate Cobe and lived in her house. He would become their link to freedom. I turned to him to uh, see if he would be willing to help these people out, speaking to him in Thai, uh, which we were pretty sure the Iranians would not understand. He told me uh, to find a place, find a place for, for five of them to stay. Then I decided and I told him, uh, Mr. Garrett House, he said, he said, good, that's a good location. For the next five days, the Americans hid in this house, listening to the news on TV and radio. When they heard a diplomatic mission from the states led by Ramsey Clark had failed to even meet with the Ayatollah Khomeini, their anxiety turned to fear and panic. For one week, the most powerful nation in the world had been unable to help its hostages. We lost contact with Vic about Wednesday or Thursday. The foreign ministry no longer allowed our phone calls to go through. And he said that um, they could not use the phone anymore, and uh, we were on our own, and uh, good luck. I decided to tell him, we, we better move to another house. And he took us to Kate Cobb's house, which was just a couple of blocks away. Um, in a car driven by an Iranian friend of his, who he trusted. And it was right up against the street. In fact, uh, we could not go in the kitchen without risking being seen by any person walking down the sidewalk. And I think we decided uh, within a few minutes of our arrival that this was just not an acceptable hiding place. So I thought it would be a good idea to, to do something which I had had in the back of my mind all the time. And that was to call my good friend from the Canadian Embassy, John Sheardown. The phone rang and um, I, I get up to answer it and uh, found that it was Bob Anders. John said to me, uh, he says, well, why didn't you call sooner? He says, come on over here, you can stay with us. And uh, so of course I immediately felt very relieved about that. Uh, then I said, uh, well, uh, well, that sounds great, John. Uh, by the way, I've got, uh, I've got four other people with me. And he said right away, he came back, that's all right, bring them all. We can take care of all of you. That offer of sanctuary by Canadian First Secretary John Sheardown and his British wife, Zena, was to be the turning point for the five fugitive Americans. Zena Sheardown, though, did not have diplomatic immunity. Her decision to take in the Americans was particularly courageous. At the Canadian Embassy in Tehran, Sheardown told his boss, Ambassador Ken Taylor, about the fugitive Americans. I was certainly not aware of any Americans being outside the embassy. I was delighted to, to hear that some had made their way out and that we were in a position to be of some help to them. The five Americans were picked up by two British embassy cars and taken to the Sheardown residence. 
So from November the 10th, Cora and Mark Lijak, along with Consul Bob Anders, stayed at the Sheardown's house with Zena and John. Joe and Kathy Stafford stayed at Ambassador Ken Taylor's house. That same day, a few European diplomats were escorted into the U.S. Embassy to see the hostages. They only saw some of them and reported that they were being well-treated. Other hostages, though, were still being terrorized. They grabbed us, blindfolded us, and took us outside and lined us against the wall and uh, just like slammed you against the wall and you put your hands up on the wall and we could hear them walking in back. They pushed me against the wall like this. And it was like, holy shit, what's going down? I thought for sure that we were going to be executed. I was sure of it. And next thing I know, they started cham chambering rounds behind us. Um, and all of a sudden, the temperature dropped about another 30 degrees. And it got real cold. I remember hearing them click the bolts of their rifles and uh, I was just waiting for what I thought would be a loud crash and everything to fade out and that would be the end of life. Waiting for it and this really morbid curiosity overtook me wondering would I feel it how long would the pain last? Would everything go slow motion? Would it just be uh, uh, like being hit in the back of the head by a two-by-four and then blackness and the light at the end of the tunnel? Nothing else could be done. Beyond my control. There's no point. I uh, didn't want to be a fool. I didn't want to go shout screaming. Just uh, go down with some dignity, at least, and accept it. And next thing you know, the person at the door of the terminal says, okay and close the door and we were alone and we just looked at each other and said what the hell was that and it was over any encouraging news from Iran status closer yes I'm quite sorry back in the United States frustration had turned to anger any Iranian on the street could become a target. Jimmy Carter chose to hit back at Iran through economic measures. No one should underestimate the resolve of the American government and the American people in this matter. On November 12th, he cut off oil imports from Iran and then froze Iranian assets in U.S. banks. Despite this, on November 18th, after help from PLO leader Yasser Arafat, the Ayatollah Khomeini ordered the release of three American hostages. Sergeant William Quarles, Secretary Kathy Gross, and Sergeant Liddell Maples. The most difficult part was sitting in a chair for 16 hours a day with your arms tied to the arms of the chair. Their release was followed two days later by 10 more hostages being freed, four women and six of the black hostages. This was the first time they had seen each other since the takeover. They were taken to Tehran's Merabad airport, where they gave a press conference. The other two women that are still being held hostage are Kate Koob and Elizabeth Swift. Kate Koob is, a, is an employee of ICA, and she is an officer. And Elizabeth Swift is, is a political officer. And all I can conclude is that after the interrogation process that we were all submitted to, there, there must still be some doubt about them. Unfortunately. The news of their release took three months to reach Anne Swift and Kate Cobe, who were kept in total isolation in the embassy. But in February, when I found out, in fact, that um, five women and eight blacks had been released, it, that day was just really uh, a day of euphoria. I, it, it was almost it was next, next best thing to being sent home myself. The freed Americans did not speak publicly about their experiences because the Ayatollah was now threatening to try the remaining hostages as spies. The people working here were not diplomats. In fact, as the Imam Khomeini said, we have found no evidence that proves that these people are diplomats. All evidence proves that these people are spies.
the date of the trials are not fixed because we believe that the United States must return the Shah. As in any foreign embassy, information gathering is of prime importance and it is now known that there were at least three CIA operatives among the 53 hostages. These documents, plus the forged passports discovered by the students, show the detailed undercover identities of the agents. This embassy staffer, Thomas Ahern, had no less than three different aliases with passports for each. We were born in Antwerp, Belgium, 8th of July, 1934. Your cover occupation is that of a commercial business representative. These developments caused great concern to the Swedish ambassador and his staffer who was hiding Lee Schatz. The ambassador needed help and confided in his colleague, Canadian ambassador Ken Taylor. The conversation opened by saying that it seemed appropriate that we could possibly offer some help since he could easily be seen as a Canadian. My response was that, well, possibly, of course, we could since we already have five I'm not realizing that he didn't realize we had the five. I think he was as astounded as I was. Ambassador Taylor arranged uh, that um, I meet with someone who knew both of us, uh, who would take us to where Lee was staying. Back home in Idaho, Lee Schatz was front page news. The State Department had told his mother that he was safe, but forgot to tell her not to tell the press. In Washington and New York, other American journalists were also aware that some Americans had escaped the takeover. But the White House asked for a publication freeze, and they all agreed to it. For Sam Chai, the Thai cook, that silence probably saved his life, because the militants were now checking the hostages' residences and found him at Kate Cove's house. One of the guys, they put the gun on my stomach. Then they say, where's the American? Where's the American? I said, no, I don't have American. I work in Peter American, but my boss is at the embassy already. There's no American around here. If they find out is that I hide the American people and help the American people, they will, they will kill me. That's why I left everything, then I left. I'm go to the... Sam Chai is an unsung hero of the U.S. hostage crisis. He spent the next 18 months in hiding, living in the basements of friends' homes, coming out only at night to find food and fresh air. In a more restricted situation were the 53 hostages, most of whom had been moved to a storage warehouse they called the Mushroom Inn. Here in this windowless environment, they were incarcerated for many months. When you were locked in there, it was like a bank vault that I said. Not only didn't you see the sun, but you were completely cut off from the world. It was quiet all the time. Even the birds didn't sing over there. And it was just the roaring silence all the time. Many hostages spent up to half a year here, two to a room, under 24-hour surveillance. Talking was forbidden. Nighttime was when they flipped off the lights. <clears throat> and daytime was when they turned on the lights. That was, that was day and that was night and that was it. Uh, the only time we saw the sun, as I said, we were taken outside for about 20 minutes to exercise, walk around. And it was just such a tremendous feeling, tremendous feeling to be able to not only see the outside, to feel a breeze, uh, but to hear the birds, to hear the traffic, just hear a car and horn. Um, it was a really exhilarating feeling to go out when you got outside. Back at the foreign ministry, life was at least bearable. Thompson, Howland, and Langen were now living in the ballroom. They were allowed some visitors, but they were still prisoners. We had two means of, uh, of communicating written messages, uh, uh, one very much above board and the other uh, not. The first was uh, via the Iranian foreign ministry telex to their embassy here in Washington, which in turn passed them on to the State Department. The other method uh, was to uh, give messages to various of our visitors who came in to see us. These visitors relayed information about the hostages' condition to Langen. The particular burden that rested on the three of us in the first days and indeed throughout the 444 was the 
appreciation, the, pre the realization that we could do so little to help our colleagues in the compound because we had no way, no leverage, no power to do anything about our colleagues. By December, Foreign Minister Bani Sadr, who had replaced Ibrahim Yazdi, was himself replaced by Sadegh Gopsadeh, and the negotiations stalled again. We are not bound to accept the arbitrary decision by anyone on the face of Earth. For a government to applaud mob violence and terrorism, for a government actually to support and in effect participate and the taking and the holding of hostages is unprecedented in human history. Jimmy Carter then ordered most of Iran's diplomats out of the U.S. The following day, December 13th, the Shah left for Panama. It was hoped that his departure would bring the crisis to an end, but it did not. However, in Iran, government officials did allow the three Americans held in the foreign ministry to see other diplomats. One was Ken Taylor. Ken Taylor told us that he was in very close and continuing contact with Ottawa and Washington on a plan that was evolving, um, but uh, I, he did not share with us then the specifics. The six house guests in hiding with the Canadians knew nothing of these plans. They had settled into a daily routine of playing Scrabble, listening to the news, reading, and drinking more than they ever had before. We were the kids, and John was big daddy, and we, we waited for him to come home every night because he always had something of interest, uh, or hopefully he would, uh, something of interest for us to hear about. The news they wanted to hear was that the crisis would be over by Christmas, but it was not to be. However, their Canadian hosts made the Christmas of 1979 special for the six fugitive Americans. I can look back at that... Christmas, for example, and think to myself that in many ways that's the best Christmas I've ever had. But we had a really, a really good Christmas, uh, a lot better than, than our friends did. And I guess that was something we always had to think about. That even when we were bummed out and depressed, we knew we were always better than our friends were down, downtown. The militants allowed three American clergymen to come and celebrate Christmas with the hostages. I saw the film of, the, of that first Christmas, and it looks so nice. You're sitting on the couch, and you've got all these cookies and candies in front of you, and this preacher's sitting there, and you have these little running guards sitting between you, and they're holding your hand and being so nice and smiling, while behind the camera there's these people with these these weapons pointing at you. <laughs> and it's, it was great. You know, One guy standing in back twirling a six-shooter. And as I walked into the room and saw the bank of... TV cameras on one side, and behind them, all of the Iranian militants there, very clearly designed to intimidate us. And that first Christmas, we were not permitted to say anything on camera. There was a camera there, and there were lights there. I chose to ignore the signs, the posters, the cameras, and everything, and focus on what was, for me, the central thing of Christmas, which is, is the Christmas worship. Not only was it spiritually uh, uplifting at Christmas, extremely so, but at the same time, it also brought back the memories much more poignantly, very poignant memories of our past Christmases. And the contrast was pretty profound. I was so livid that I was really uh, impolite to the, the minister who came. Um, I was in uh, no condition to think about peace on earth, goodwill toward men that night. <laughs>
In the United States, it was a painful Christmas for the families of the hostages, including the parents of Jimmy Lopez. Special services were held in churches and cathedrals across the country. American emotions finally overflowed when the Iranian television coverage of the hostages was released. Marcy Lopez, Jimmy's sister, symbolized the nation's anguish. At least I know he's okay. That he's not being treated wrongly or fed wrongly or anything. So my main goal is to get him home. And I guess that's the whole world's goal. The hostages are pushed from the headlines by the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Six days later, the hostages are back in the news as Kurt Waldheim, the UN Secretary General, arrives in Iran to try to negotiate an end to the hostage crisis. After narrowly escaping an angry crowd, meeting with government officials, and sympathizing with the victims of the Shah's secret police, Waldheim's mission finally collapsed when he was rebuffed by the Ayatollah Khomeini, who refused to meet with him. Meanwhile, at the CIA's headquarters in Langley, Virginia, six Canadian passports like these were being doctored with the necessary stamps, visas, and photos of the six Americans in hiding. The passports arrived at Maribad Airport by diplomatic courier. We were given background information on Canada because, unfortunately, we're quite illiterate to our next-door neighbor to the north. Learning to say A eh, and <laughs> eating with our left hand. I had to find out... Uh, that it was actually Toronto, Canada, instead of Toronto, Canada. Toronto, like piranha. Eh? All of us were part of a group of a Canadian uh, uh, business uh, uh, venture and uh, checking out the situation in Iran. That's why we're supposedly were there. We were given our new names and dates of birth and, and that kind of stuff and asked to start learning who we were going to be. By January 27th, nearly all the Canadian embassy staff, including John and Zena Sheardown and Ken Taylor's wife, Pat, had left Tehran, supposedly on holiday. It had been decided that the escape from Iran was to take place on January 28th, during the Iranian elections. The Americans made their way to the airport in our office cars as friends of mine. You know, when you're sitting there in the car and it's dark and you're just driving it, uh... I began to imagine all sorts of terrible things that were, were going to happen when we got there. So I was wearing dark glasses. Uh, I think I used a little uh, eyebrow pencil to darken up my eyebrows. I combed my hair in a little different way. And uh, the girls changed their hairdos. To walk into a crowded airport lobby was very scary. It felt very strange. Um, but after we stood there for a minute or so, then it was okay. Uh, but that made me very nervous. Normally, the man stood there, took your passport, stamped it, and you were on your way. That particular morning, there, for some reason, was a change. He took my passport, looked at it, and stepped into a side room. Three long minutes later, he returned. And he looked at me and in broken English said, is this you? And it was a very stern picture, uh, no smile. And that morning I was trying to be as cheerful as I really could when I was talking to any of the officials. And I got a very stern look on my face and pulled down my mustache and said, yes. And he kind of smiled and then I smiled and he handed me my passport. And on I went. That's the point where you really begin anticipating. I mean, you're so close, but yet there are still a few more vital things to do. And uh, going on board and sitting down was uh, you know, just that much closer. And mentally, I think we were counting uh, now to uh, minutes. And uh, fortunately, once we were on board, uh, takeoff was almost immediate. Lee and I both leaned out in the aisle and looked at each other with a with a kind of a knowing look and a smile on her face, and we were really very happy.
So we toasted to the mountains as we flew over the Turkish border. Uh, it was obviously the high point of the trip. I mean, it just felt so good to be finally out of there. Finally, we landed in Frankfurt and uh, back in the real world. And uh, it was a great, great uh, feeling to be out of that situation. We both kind of looked at each other and then just in unison stomped our feet out of the ground one more time. And uh, it was over for us. The four remaining Canadians closed down the embassy and took the next flight out of Iran. The escape of the six Americans was supposed to have been kept secret, but Canadian journalists broke the story on the morning of January 29th. The Canadian caper became one of the few bright moments in the long, bleak months of the Iranian hostage crisis. The six flew home to a hero's welcome. When we walked into the lobby of the State Department, it was filled with people. And I was totally overwhelmed. And it's the closest I've ever really come to crying in public. There was so much emotion in the air. Sooner or later, here or anywhere in the world, Canada will pay for this violation of the sovereignty of Iran. After the Iranian elections, the new president, Abul Hassan Bani Sadr, started secret negotiations with the Americans through two lawyers in France. These talks led to a scenario for transferring the hostages from the student militants to the Iranian government, which in turn would release the hostages to the Americans. How nice of you to come. Thank you so very much for coming. It was also agreed that the hostages could be visited. How do you do, sir? Hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank Good. you so much for coming. That's wonderful. But this is a special, this is an answer to a prayer, because it's been almost two months since Christmas, and I was praying that, that we could have a chaplain. <laughs> thank you. You are sick? I was sick of you, this. You don't look... You are, uh, well, they had us cleaned up. The plan called for doctors to visit the hostages and report they were being mistreated, a practice opposed by Islamic law. This would give the Ayatollah a reason to have the hostages transferred to the Iranian government. Well, I took my, my glasses. We haven't been able to find waves inside my body. And it's been going on since January. And you can see, see my eyes. In return for transferring the hostages, the United Nations agreed to set up a commission of inquiry into the crimes of the Shah. The commission came and everything went according to plan, but then the Ayatollah changed his mind. On March 11th, the UN commission left Iran. The agreement had collapsed. It was obvious the government had no real power. Our positions about the hostages is rather clear, so... They are the hostages and they remain the hostages. To add to the United States problems, the Shah, who was now in Panama and threatened with deportation to Iran, took up Carter's promise that he could return to the U.S. But to dissuade him, Carter ruled that he would have to abdicate the Peacock throne first. This the Shah refused to do. The last flight of his life was to Egypt. Back in the U.S., the hostage crisis had become a daily obsession on all three networks. They were there over Christmas and they were there for Easter. It's day number 155. They grasped at opportunities to show pictures of the hostages. Today was one of those narrow openings. For the students, it was a propaganda ploy to get world coverage. For the hostages, it was an opportunity to communicate with their loved ones. Food is good 
and it's more than adequate. And um, the only reason I'm losing weight, Mother, is because I decided that was one thing I could do while I was here. <laughs> and, uh, I it's hard to do. <laughs> I don't have a and we got back and we realized that indeed we had um, probably given a much more positive picture than we would have chosen to give it. Um, had we thought more carefully about it and so we determined right then and there that if another such time came that uh, we'd be a, a little bit more um, controlled in what we had to say. Even reports from visitors, however well-meaning, were often misleading. They have exercise bicycles, ping pong, watch TV, uh, see movies, video cassettes, uh, the food is fine. Oh yeah, I remember the Easter. That was when uh, Rue Piper came over. Boy, he really got a lot of us mad. He turned a blind eye to everything that was actually going on and saw only what he wanted to. They showed us their library. It's a room almost this size, just covered with books, and they're going to get more books. It was impossible to talk to the man. He didn't want to hear it. You would try to tell him something, and he just shut you off. But the visits were also an opportunity for the hostages to get letters from home. I wrote you a letter from your family. Oh, thank you. I thought maybe it was a ticket to America. Ah, let us hope. It will come soon. Missing or censored mail was always a major issue, both for the families and for the hostages. To me, it was clear that they were using mail as an intimidation point, uh, either against us or against our families. This was too much for Moorfield's wife, who took up the issue on national television. Why are we not being allowed to hear from the hostages? Why isn't there mail coming out of that embassy in Tehran? Well, perhaps one reason is because your CIA is so sophisticated. They bragged that my wife had been on national TV with their charging affairs and had accused the CIA of, of withholding my mail. And I don't think they realized how much it told me. It told me first that we still had diplomatic relations with Iran and um, that the hostages were an issue, that the American people had not forgotten about the hostages, that our condition, living conditions and uh, mail was specifically was an issue, and um, that my wife had gone public. And knowing my wife, my wife, uh, I presume she was doing a fairly effective job, and that was what was bothering them. Listen, I got a Each letter home became a moment of joy, but to punish Mrs. Moorfield, in the 444 days, the Iranians allowed only four letters to get through. Day 173 was Operation Eagle Claw, an Entebbe-style rescue mission using Hercules aircraft and eight Sea Stallion helicopters. A minimum of six choppers had to make it to Desert One. Because of sandstorms, only five arrived. Colonel Charlie Beckwith was their leader. Without uh, six flyable helicopters, you couldn't make it. Wasn't any way to do it. Colonel Beckwith had no choice but to abort the mission, and President Carter agreed. As the commandos prepared to sneak out, one of the helicopters hit a Hercules transport. The explosion sent a ball of fire 400 feet into the sky. The toll was eight servicemen dead and five wounded. The corpses were abandoned along with several sets of mission plans. The failure of the mission was the low point of the whole hostage crisis. I wasn't really for a rescue mission. Uh, what I wanted the U.S. to do more like more along the lines of you have 24 hours to let our people go or we're going to turn you into the world's largest parking lot. Jimmy Lopez and I were sharing the office that was the furthest away from the entrance to the main chancery building. So we were the furthest from the rescuers and the closest to the militants. I think it's highly unlikely that I would have been uh, rescued. The aborted raid was a humiliating blow for America. The bodies were brought back to Tehran and displayed in coffins inside the compound. 
In early May, the charred bodies of the eight dead Americans were returned to the U.S. Ayatollah Kalkali spat farewell to the dead commandos. The mission had been opposed by Cyrus Vance. He resigned and was replaced as Secretary of State by Edmund Muskie. When the bodies of the Americans finally arrived home, a period of national mourning commenced in the United States. Your risk, your suffering, your loss are not in vain. I fervently pray that those who are still held hostage will be freed without more bloodshed. Although no one knew it, the hostages had reached the halfway mark of their captivity. After the aborted mission, some of the hostages had been moved outside Tehran. Richard Queen was still in the embassy. One morning I woke up and I had a slight numbness on the left hand. And I thought originally that, oh, I probably just slept in my arm. But it didn't go away. And it said spread slowly up the arm until it eventually affected the whole left half of my body, particularly the left hand. Queen was examined by a doctor who laughed off his illness. I couldn't walk. I was nauseous all the time, and I couldn't eat anything. I was vomiting constantly. So eventually they thought that possibly I might be dying. To have a hostage die would have been embarrassing for the militants, so they sent Queen to a Tehran hospital. There, the doctors diagnosed his illness as multiple sclerosis, which is potentially life-threatening. They said, you're going back? I initially thought oh, I'm going back to the compound, and I said, I thought it was a little bit soon, because I had my intravenous feeding the tubes and so forth. He said, no, 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 you're going back home. And then he said, I had told Khomeini, has released you to your parents. They uh, then uh, turned on the radio, and there it was. I didn't, my Farsi is not that good, but certainly I can make up my name. On July 10th, he was taken to Maribad Airport for a flight to Switzerland. I got on that plane, and they put me on first class and all that. So... Uh, they started wheeling out, they wheeled out this giant breakfast, not for me, but for the first class passengers. And I was starved and I was famished. I started eating anything and everything that came within grasp. In Zurich, Queen was taken to the hospital and his parents were flown in from the United States to meet him. He was flown back to the States within a week. I knew I was out. I could tell I was out, but my mind, didn't really jump to that conclusion. I really can't express in words what it's like to be back to America again. I, I, I really can't say much more. I just wish that there were 52 more with me. And uh, all I said, there are 14 out now and there are 52 more to go. July 27, 1980, was a day of euphoria in Iran. The self-proclaimed King of Kings and the Light of the Aryans was dead from cancer. But his death had no immediate effect on the hostages because the Ayatollah was still consolidating his power. It wasn't until a new cabinet was in place in September that the former West German ambassador to Iran, Gerhard Ritzel, was contacted by a close aide of the Ayatollah. Secret meetings with the Iranians were held in West Germany throughout September, and release seemed imminent. But war intervened. On September 22, 1980, Iraq invaded Iran, and the talks were pushed aside once again. For the hostages, the ordeal continued. There were a couple of people over in Tehran that cracked, they couldn't handle it, and they went slightly crazy. And Others were pulling them through. Um, there was one person in particular that used to fry out. He would 
jump up and convulse and hop around the room and, and just all this bundle of energy coming out and he'd be mumbling and talking to himself and crying and giggling and laughing. The man would go totally ballistic and have not know what was going on around him. And he'd sit back down and wouldn't remember. He would not know what was going on. We were never, Ann and I, permitted to see any of the men. We had no contact with uh, our colleagues, and that was perhaps one of the most difficult things to, to deal with. There were at least two unsuccessful suicide attempts during the captivity, but there were also many efforts to escape. One was made by Stephen Lauterbach. Three attempts were made by Malcolm Kalp. His window was welded shut. Six of them worked me over and beat me into unconsciousness on two occasions kept me handcuffed and tied for seven straight days and nights and they kicked me in the temple a couple of times and I still have a consistent ringing in my ears. Kalp then spent 374 days in solitary confinement. Another hostage, military attaché Charles Scott, endured an incredible 408 days in a closet-like cell with no windows or air circulation. Earlier, some of the men had been through a second mock execution. They were standing behind us with the rifles, and I'm standing against the wall, and finally I said, the hell with this? And I sat down, and the kid came up, right, and grabbed me and says, no, you must stand, you must stand. I turned around and said, up yours. And the kid said, if you do not, it will be very serious for you. I turned around and said, what are you going to do, shoot me? <laughs> you know, it's like, go ahead, I don't care anymore, guy. And so I sat there, and they went and conversed, and pretty soon they walked around telling everybody else to sit down. So I scored a little moral victory for me. Scoring points against the guards was one way some of the hostages developed a psychological edge. The guards themselves began to show signs of strain. He sort of slumped down in a chair and informed us that we really should feel sorry for him because he had almost had a nervous breakdown taking care of all of us and seeing that nothing had happened to us. And this had really been quite a strain on him. And, you know, five to seven months was one thing, but this had gone on just a little too long. And I said, so send us home. As the fighting between Iran and Iraq took its toll and with sanctions beginning to have an effect, the hostage crisis was becoming a hindrance. On day 365, the Iranian parliament rubber-stamped Khomeini's conditions for the hostages' release. They wanted the late Shah's wealth, and Iran's money in the U.S. banks returned, and the U.S. to stay out of Iran, dropping all its claims. Back in the United States, the hostage crisis had become an election issue. My thoughts and my prayers for our hostages in Iran are as though they were my own sons and daughters. On November 4th, Americans went to the polls and the result was an overwhelming victory for Ronald Reagan. Immediately, the pace of the negotiations picked up. Algeria was named as an intermediary and serious talks started on November 10th. Again, a release appeared imminent. Within a few weeks, the militants announced that they had officially handed the hostages over to the government. The Americans were never to return to the embassy compound. The grounds were open to the public. Kate Kolb and Anne Swift were moved first to a prison and eventually to a building where they caught occasional sight of some of the men. Their appearances had changed, beards had been grown and that sort of thing. Um, and we had this feeling again of being back among some of our colleagues. As the shuttle diplomacy with the Algerians and the Iranians continued, hope grew that the 52 hostages would be home for Christmas. But the dream was dashed when the Ayatollah's new prime minister, Rajai, suddenly demanded $24 billion in gold and cash. The result was that the hostages had to spend a second Christmas in captivity. We decided that it was perhaps more important to let our families know that we really, were really all right than anything else. And so the question was, what could you do or say? I'm feeling good, and I've lost weight, for which I'm grateful. Anne and I keep busy every day. We're reading and studying faithfully, and I love you all very much. And I look forward to being with you, hopefully, as soon as we can. Merry Christmas. I want to tell her how much I miss her 
especially now at Christmas, that I love her very much. And a little baby grandson that I have not seen, Michael, that I hope to see them soon. Merry Christmas to you all. And to my mother. <laughs> Dear Mom. And Scott, I expect you to continue the good work in school and help Mom around the house. And don't forget to feed the wild birds this winter. They'll probably be getting hungry. I am all right. I do expect to come home. When, I don't know. How goes the negotiations? Are we going home? They're not going good. They're They're going good. good. Hopeful or not? Uh, we can... We can. For the first time in over a year, all the hostages were brought together, including the three from the foreign ministry. Things have been much better. We've been here a week. This is lovely. They were all in a mansion owned by the government. I, I was convinced that this was the beginning of the last act. Tom Seth believed that if a deal to release them were to be made, it would have to be before Reagan's inauguration on January 20th. One day before that deadline, an agreement was struck. On the night before the 20th, they came in and said they were going to release some of us. We were told that there would be examinations on the part of the, uh, on the part of doctors in another part of the building. We were taken there blindfolded and then uh, when the blindfolds were removed, realized that we were being examined by Algerian doctors. A clear sign that something was about to happen. We were interviewed on Iranian TV. Um, my name is Victor Tom Seth. I, my job at the embassy. I was counselor for political affairs, and today is January 19th, 1981. They said, uh, uh, we need an interview. We want to tape you. Uh, just keep in mind that it is up to us whether or not you leave. In other words, talk good about us, and we'll let you go. If you don't, you're staying here. I did not think it was correct for the Iranian people to seize an embassy and hold diplomats hostage. I still say that today is the same thing as I said the day I was taken. And uh, have you learned anything from this experience this time? Personally, yes, a lot, but more than I think that you or any of your friends would want to know. And could anyone claim that uh, you have been tortured here or you have been brainwashed here? Uh, yeah, that's a very deep and probing question, and uh, I hesitate to answer, because I, I don't know what sort of agreements have been met between the negotiating committees on what to say on that. You can introduce yourself if you like and say how you are. One hostage, Master Sergeant Regis Reagan, refused to cooperate with the interviewers. For his defiance, he was brutally beaten after the Algerian doctors had seen him. They came in early that morning and told us to pack our trash. Uh, they didn't tell us why, and we figured, oh, we're going back to the prison. One of the student militants burst into the room where Bruce and I had been together for the previous uh, uh, day and a half or so and said we had 15 minutes to, uh, to get ready to go to the airport. Ann and I reached in the cupboard and pulled out our getaway bags and said, we're ready, let's go. I don't recall that I felt anything but uh, sort of an incredu incredulous sensation that this uh, thing was finally coming to an end. And they took off our blindfolds and it was like, wow, they're not supposed to do this. Uh, something was definitely different. And by this time it was late at night. And we pulled in the airport, we could hear the jet engines whining, we could see the, uh, there were bright lights on. At the airport we were taken out one by one, the blindfolds were removed, and then we were run through a kind of gauntlet uh, uh, to the uh, gangway up to the airplane itself. By that time, it was all a little numb, I think. 
Even though we had to go through this line of jeering um, Iranian students, my feeling was this was their last gasp because they realized they had lost. As they were pulling across one of the rags, the guard was standing there. And he had this really stern look on his face. And as I was going up, I gave him the bird behind my back. I flipped him off. And uh, I guess the little guy, I don't know who it was, someone hit me in the back in the kidneys. But I figured, hey, last shot guy, I'd take it. I don't know, I still, I guess deep down inside, I really still didn't believe that I was going home. There were all of our colleagues standing there, and I remember, of course, seeing Gary Rosen and John Graves and Bill Royer, who were my USIA colleagues, and um, hugs and and um, and two questions. Is Ev and never got the question finished. Yes, everybody's here was the answer. And uh, how how are you? As you can appreciate a riotous celebration of reunion in the aisles of that aircraft to the point where the crew, I think, despaired at times we would ever sit down. I remember somebody saying, you people have got to sit down and we'll never get this plane off the ground. And when it began to move, there was a giant cheer. It got up to the head of the runway and there was another cheer and it began to roll down the runway and there was another cheer. We were airborne, and it's uh, yet again a cheer. And the last cheer, I think, was when it was announced over the uh, intercom that we had passed out of Iranian airspace. That's when they broke out the champagne. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Some 30 minutes ago, the planes bearing our prisoners left Iranian airspace and are now free of Iran. I remember getting off the plane in Algeria and seeing our ambassador and his wife standing at both of them with tears just streaming down their cheeks and not really being able to comprehend. These pictures were broadcast live to the United States. The nation watched, especially the hostage families. This is the Lopez family. From Algeria, they flew to West Germany, and after four days of hot showers and long-distance phone calls, they finally set off for home. What's the first thing you're going to do when you get back? Today? Yeah. Take my wife in my arms. It was day one of picking up their lives again. The 444-day crisis was finally over.
all of a sudden this little rug rat breaks through the crowd and starts climbing towards me and turned as my sister Marcy and I was amazed at how much she'd grown. Next week on Frontline, a report on the skyrocketing number of medical malpractice suits in this country and how they are affecting the way doctors practice medicine. One out of six American doctors faces a malpractice lawsuit. What does this mean for the patients? Patients are aware of the malpractice crisis and patients will ask you straight off, are you doing this because you're concerned about my suing you? The tough case is the bad outcome that you just don't know what role you played in the bad outcome. Do malpractice suits make medicine safer? The only protection that the patients have is the malpractice lawyer. And if something goes wrong, I'm screwed. The program is called Sue the Doctor. It is next week on Frontline. I'm Judy Woodruff. Good night. For a transcript of this program, please send $4 to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for Frontline was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Schools, colleges, and other organizations interested in purchasing or renting video cassettes of this program may call 800-424-7963 or write PBS Video, Post Office Box 8092, Washington, D.C., 20024.